Welcome to the Pitching Command Show, brought to you by Command Tracker, the smart target that MLB and D1 teams rely upon to measure and train command. Many throw hard, but few command. Visit commandtracker.com. Five, four, three, two, one. Joining today's podcast is the great Ricky Meinhold, the App State Pitching Coach. Welcome, Ricky. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Yeah. Hey, uh, over a 13-year coaching career, you've worked across nearly every level of baseball, from pitching coach and pitching evaluator for Team USA's 72 and 18U, to coaching in college as pitching coach for University of Missouri, in the minor leagues with St. Louis Cardinals and New York Mets, in Major League Baseball with the Mets as assistant Major League pitching coach, as well as internationally as a director of pitching for the Latte Giants of Korean Baseball Association. And now you're the pitching coach of App State. Wow, you have a very well-rounded pitching resume. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very lucky. I'm very grateful. Um, uh, if you had asked me 13 years ago if this would have been my story, I would have called you crazy. So I'm, I'm grateful for the experiences and the people that entrusted me to do those jobs. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. That's a lot of great experience, too. Uh, oh, yeah. Everyone always talks about max velocity all the time. And on this show, we try to focus on the other things you need to succeed as a pitcher, such as control, command, sequencing, and mental training and character. For example, uh, Mariano Rivera was mid-90s on his cutter. But in 2008, he averaged 93.7. And in 2009, he averaged at 92.3. If Velo was the all that he needed, uh, Mariano should not have had such great results. Now, we all know there's more to making a good pitch than to just max velocity. I would describe a good pitch as one with uh, the correct location for the situation, the correct speed for the situation, and good movement. How would you describe what makes a good pitch? I mean, that's very well said. I think uh, the way you explain it is something that I preach uh, in my daily. Um, it's kind of exactly like that, to be honest, maybe verbatim. Um, but I think um, the one piece of that puzzle um, that can be answered is the hitter tells you. Um, there is a human in the box uh, that you're facing that has a bat in the hand that's trying to do something uh, to the pitches that you're throwing. That's and a great when, point. when when the pitcher is getting results that are minimizing the impact that a hitter can do. I think that that should speak something to you um, to go on top of what you explained earlier. I think that those things go into it because at the end of the day, you'll, uh, we, the old school, new school uh, conversation. I mean, it's just baseball. In my opinion, um, we learn and grow and they learned and grew um, 10 years prior, 20 years prior with the, with the uh, availability of information that was there at that stage, we're just getting a little bit deeper into it. Some people say we're getting a little too deep, but at the same time, I think you have to understand um, that hitter pitcher interaction and the competition that goes into that. Um, conversely, there's a, it's a game. It's not like you're sitting in a facility and you're just ripping stuff. Yes. There's predictive metrics. Right. Yes. There's predictive things, but at the end of the day, the hitters, the hitters will tell you if your stuff's good or not, uh, good or not. And that goes with the, what you're throwing, where you're throwing it and how you're throwing it. And I think you have to pay attention to those finer details uh, to really understand in depth of like what a good pitch is. Yeah, uh, that's very well said. Uh, I see a lot of people online who mistake command and control all the time. Uh, to me, control is the ability to throw strikes. And command is the ability to throw the ball where you choose, in or out of the zone. Uh, how do you describe control and how do you describe command? I, I mean, again, I think it's verbatim of what you said. Um, I think control is the ability to fill up that rectangle thing that we call a strike zone and uh, mm -hmm. give yourself a chance to compete to get that hitter out. Um, granted, you have a, we call balls and strikes, four balls is a walk and three strikes is a strikeout and, and so on and so forth. So you have a certain amount of pitches to get in the area. Uh, so control is somebody who can and gets, get a hitter to entice uh, a swing into uh, this area around the strike zone. Command mm -hmm. is being able to maximize your ability to use your stuff where you want to use it to expose uh, potential hitters weakness or get them out uh, in a certain plan uh, or uh, I guess sequence uh, of, yeah, of events yeah, like right? if you, so, 
like if a, a guy is on, on the plate and you brush him, pitch in to get him off it or uh, going away uh, for a pit out pitch, uh, there's so many tactics to use with a command, you know? Yeah, it's like the pitch before the pitch or um, the pitch yeah. after the pitch, right? Like you have yeah. to be able to pay attention. Again, going back to the first answer to the first question of what the hitter's seeing and what the hitter's doing yeah. and how they're reacting and being able to know that, one, being able to read that and then be able to execute the plan after that. That is like, that is the true definition of command, in my opinion, is being able to do what you want when you want to do it and know a certain uh, sequence of events. We talk, We can talk about, uh, profiling of, of understanding you, your stuff where we live in a data world, right? Um, mm -hmm. Back in the day, they didn't necessarily have data as much as they do now from a pitch metric standpoint. And you'll always hear me say as a pitching coach, the way we move directly affects how the ball comes out of our hand. Well, with that, that comes ball flight. And with the ball flight, that is certain look like Mariana Rivera was able to do one pitch really, really, really well for a long time that got, got him unanimous in the Hall of Fame. There is a reason why he was able to do that all at the time and be able to execute it from a command standpoint, but also from a body movement to get his hand to a certain spot to be able to do well, this something with well, the ball. Well, what, let's take, that's a good example. Like, how would you describe why he was so good with that pitch? Now, my thought is that he had great command with it. And he, and he threw it to the locations that would fit best for that pitch. And it had outlier movement, not our, uh, outlier velocity, but outlier movement. That's my take on it. Yeah, I don't think, like, yeah, that's a really good point. And I, when you say uh, it didn't have outlier velocity, it was hard enough. If it was softer, I don't or way softer, I'll say that, because like you said at the beginning, he, he didn't regress very much when his velo dropped three miles an hour. But if mm -hmm. it was from 95 to 93, we're not talking that big of a difference necessarily. But mm -hmm. if we're talking 95 to 87, 88, I, oh, yeah, we, don't, yeah. we don't know if that would have – he never did that, right? So we don't mm -hmm. know if uh, if that would have changed his, his results and what he did. But at the same time, I think the one thing about um, – the the essence of being a pitcher is understanding yourself um, as deep as you possibly can. And he Absolutely. understood his delivery. He understood uh, what came off his fingertips and how to and what it was going to do once it did that. And when he when he was able to um, have when he was at the height of his career, when he had peak velocity and command and was a younger guy, right, his body recovered better, all that physical stuff that goes with um just how the how the body ages and mm -hmm. the the strenuous work that takes in a 162 game season for 15 plus years all that stuff as he got older he still never lost the feel of what he did well from a physical well, that, standpoint that, well that's a, a great point because i'm a big believer in bu and i think you're saying mm -hmm. i think i'm hearing what you're saying is that he knew who he was and he took what he did as being good and made it great yeah, I think for me as a pitching coach, what I what I think about significantly is I want to eliminate myself as a pitching coach. And how do I do that? Well, the pitcher has to understand they're good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. all the time. Well, yeah. when they don't know that, I have to help them correlate. I have to communicate enough to get a feel for them. Like they have to feel it from a physical standpoint. Some guys, some guys learn one way. Some guys learn the other way. Some guys more, more nowadays, um, they're learning through all the fancy toys that we have back in the day when we didn't have the fancy toys, we learned through strictly feel. And I think the more, I think you, I still, I think you still need that too. hundred, hundred percent, hundred percent. You have to have feel, but the, the more we can close the gap there, where they both go one in the same that yeah. allows the individual to understand themselves, to be able to get through that battle that they have when they don't feel right. Because right. you ask any, any major league pitcher who has been in a major league uniform for a long period of time or played professional baseball for a long period of time. The reason why I say it like that is because they play longer time, like more games, longer yeah. part of the season. You ask them if, if you asked a starting pitcher on a major league organization and say, let's say they, let's just say they had 30 starts in a year. And you ask that person, how many times did you feel great? And did your, all your pitches work? And like that whole gauntlet, they're going to yeah. tell you one hand, they're going to say maybe yeah. five. Right. And, and then there's right. that other side of the spectrum where how many times did you feel like 
you know what, like crap, yeah. like where you couldn't feel anything. And there's going to be another five. It's like, who are you on the middle of that five? So who's the other 20? Like for the 30 starts, if five are great and you feel 100 million percent, and then the other five are so terrible because you feel terrible and you don't even know if you can get through an inning. Who are you guy? What guy are you in the middle of that? What's live the dash? Like, who are you in the dash? Right. And I think that allows people to, um, understand it deep enough to to make sure that they are paying attention to the little things every single day they go to work from your routine understanding when my body feels great my body's going to feel like this when my body feels not so great my body's going to feel like this and this is how i compete through those things right this is how because you ask that same person who said i felt great five times out of 30 starts how many starts went really really well there might not be any of them right like you think you're feeling so great that it doesn't come out to to be the result that you want yeah, uh, there's a great saying that uh, Dan Hefner has from DBU uh, that my son always thinks back to is that uh, winners find a way. Yeah, it's like you're yeah. struggling on the mound, but winners find a way, and that's just kind of dig down, uh, be you, uh, you know, and and win. Yeah, it's like how how do you how do you define a winner to find a way, right? How do you find, uh, how do you define those guys? Well, those are the guys. They, they, they know themselves deep enough where they know how to mentally get there then physically get there mm -hmm. to be able to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish that day, whether it's going through one inning or one batter or six inning start, like they find a way. And I, I agree yeah. with that completely. It's very well said by Coach Heath. Yeah. Uh, Heath is a great coach. Uh, what do you think a pitcher can do with command that he couldn't do with control? Like just having, uh, just being able to throw a strike. If he couldn't have command, he can do other things. What kind of other things would you say he could do? Yeah, I think um, the person who has control can can at least scratch the surface of competing in that hit, hitter pitcher confrontation. The mm -hmm. person who has command can expose the other the other side of it and and do it more efficiently potentially um i think that allows them to always be in the cold so their body's not completely taxed every time right the guys with control can get through an outing whatever that may be they can get through it and then their body reacts and recovers one way right the guys mm -hmm. that are in complete control and they're not they don't have extreme tension in their body that that they're able to command something um their body doesn't take as much of a beating per se mentally or physically and so i think that recovery aspect um is huge from a physical standpoint and then a mental standpoint where they build confidence through that and so i think guys that um have distinct command where they're able to expose the littlest things of the game i think allow them to get one step ahead of everybody else mentally and physically um, to be able to go to the next time and have the confidence to attack whatever adversity hits their way. Conversely, the control guys, when adversity hits, they only know one gear. And so they're only able to throw strikes. Yeah. They're only able right. to put the ball in one spot. Well, guys who have command can expose different angles. They can expose different quadrants of the strike zone. They can face yeah. right-handed and left-handed hitters differently, multiple different ways. Some guys with control can only do it one way, maybe two ways. That's it. And I think that's the biggest separator is it just, they're in control, just a, just a, a, a grade more or two grades more, both think, mentally and physically. Said, yeah. I think you said it very well. I, I because, uh, I think Emo, uh, you know, Scott Emerson was saying the other day, instead of making your pitches better, make better pitches. Or Greg Maddox right. would say, when when some guys get in trouble, they try to throw harder. I try to make better pitches. And that's all leading into command and how to use command. So how do you know what a better pitch is? You have to be able to command. So if you do know what the better pitch is, you still need command to do it. Because if you just rear back and fill the strike zone, well, that's that's not good enough. You know? You're you're going to get it somewhere, right? If you have the high octane velocity, you're going to get somewhere. Don't get me wrong, but the yeah. old saying, and I think this might have been mentioned on a previous podcast, maybe not. But the old saying is, "Stuff gets you there, and command keeps you there." Kind of deal. Yeah, that's, that's well, one. Yeah, that's it's extremely true because um, I've seen it obviously in my experience, but. Um, the guys that get promoted um, have the better stuff. They just overwhelm the lower levels. But once they get to a certain level, whether that's in the minor leagues or the big leagues, it kind of is to each their own, but they get exposed in certain ways. And the only thing that separates those guys is to be able to command the baseball or sequence the baseball enough that it entices the hitter to do something with it. And obviously the ones that get promoted and have success and stay up there, when they try to do something with it, 
they don't they don't create any damage or they don't create any adversity for you as a pitcher or your team. So I think those two components allow like, yeah, you have to have a certain level of stuff. We talk about guys and I know that your son is in the minor leagues like he doesn't have the elite elite stuff that people would say is graded as elite but like he's had extreme amounts of success in his minor league career well why is that because he has a baseline level of stuff and if he didn't have that baseline level of stuff his command could be up the upper echelon but if it wasn't as good of stuff it would it would it wouldn't get it uh it wouldn't have the results that he would need to move up every single level and have success it would regress at some point but if you have a baseline of stuff and there's many people you can ask that might have a different definition of what a baseline stuff needed in the major leagues is because there's a lot more that goes into it than just pure stuff numbers but at the end of the day you have to be able to do you have to take your strengths and be able to put them where you need to put them to have success consistently over different types of hitters and granted we are getting and you can go on twitter or x or whatever it's called now and, and go over the baseball talk about all hitters the same well, yeah, we're we're teaching swings that are the same. There's there's limited adjustability in swings, even at the major league level. That back in the day, that whole two strike approach thought process, like old school coaches, new school college coaches, big league coaches, like it was a badge of honor when you didn't strike out, right? And like mm-hmm. analytics have come into play a little bit more heavily, and now you can strike out two hundred times if you slug or you, you produce enough runs that uh, make that 200 strikeouts diminish to a, a, a welcoming factor. But like the baseball person in you, like strikeouts were like a negative all the time. Yeah. So when you struck out, you mm-hmm. failed. And so you needed to understand that your job is to put your team in a position to have success and strikeouts don't do that. Well, mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things, there is a, there is a baseline ability to, um, if you get people out, you have to get them out without giving uh, giving up some sort of hard hit ability or damage mm-hmm. control, basically, mm-hmm. right? And so nowadays, people are are spending the money and 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 putting everything into building as big a stuff as you possibly can, and that's diminishing the command aspect. And it's it showed its face in the major leagues a little bit, but now we're seeing it curve back to what the game really needs is somebody who can do both. And I think you have yeah. to be able to have some sort of stuff. And you have to be able to know what that stuff, how that stuff is successful based on how you execute right, pitches. Right, and the, right. That the sequence and the order of the pitches and locations matters. Uh, I was describing it to Sam Brand of uh, the Yankees the other day about in like a, a, a video game analogy where I was saying that you have all these levels that you have to bring up in a game, whether it's a shield, a weapon, or whatever it may be. And that I see pitchers uh, focusing only on velo which you do need, but you also need command, you need stuff, you need mental focus. And so this show is kind of focused on trying to uh, talk about the other things that you need all those levels of. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good point. And I think, and that's why this show is, I think, a much needed thing in our baseball community, because you think about, like, we talk about stuff plus grades and everybody has their nickname for what their stuff or arsenal score is for uh, their organization or team that gets you in the door, but to be able to compete at a high level for a long time, you're going to get to a level that exposes you if you don't have a relative. If you don't have it all. Yeah. Yeah. And so whether people, some people just, um, and don't get me wrong, there's different mental sides of this, but like some people just feel okay with, I got drafted. I played professional baseball, but the best in the world never just wanted to get drafted. They just didn't want to play professional baseball. They wanted to get to the big leagues and stay there. Yeah. Well, like there's a cartoon that I sent around to a number of my friends and it's a guy standing to hold an iPad. And he says, my spin rate was 3,900 RPMs. My velo was this. And I had a negative four on my, what? and the guy says, did you win? And he looks up at him with no answer. You know, it's like, yeah. to me, the ultimate goal is to win. So my focus has always been on, well, how do you get outs in a way that lets your team win? I have always thought that the least amount of pitches you can throw to get the most amounts out gives your team the best chance to win. Uh, that's the focus. Uh, I think if you had command and velo and stuff, then you get to be a, a Jarrett Cole. You get to be that, that elite level 
or DeGrom, right? You know, like DeGrom is known for that kind of thing too. Yeah, I think obviously um, in the best of both worlds, you want to pr- you want to promote both and you want to develop both. And I think yeah. the best pitching coaches in the world do that. Um, yeah. They take the, the canvas that is painted of who they get. Like when I was a coordinator and, and a coach in the minor leagues, um, I, we drafted certain individuals and I, I got what they, what they had. I just, uh, what my task was to help them understand it better and get and then move the needle forward on both aspects from developing better stuff, uh, whether that's velocity movement, whatever, and developing the ability to maximize that pitch. And so that's command. That's understanding themselves to a core of what they can and can't do. And there's, there's definitely different ways to skin a cat, but there's obvious similarities to success in baseball. And I think people understanding why they're good is a big question that needs to be asked over and over and over again until they understand it like black and white. And I think once they do that, that's when you see their rise as a pitcher. And like you, you comparing that to the Jacob deGrom, he, it's not like he threw a hundred miles an hour when he got drafted out of Stetson in the ninth round as a, as a former shortstop, right? They had to, he had to develop a certain repertoire that was getting people out. And he did, but remember when he got to the big leagues in 2014, I believe he was throwing 94, 95, it wasn't a hundred, 102. So over time he understood himself a little bit more. And if you look at him physically, it's not like he's changed dramatically physically, right? Like he's, he's fine tuned his craft. He understood his delivery a little bit more. He made some adjustments to his arm action that allowed him to be on time more in sequence with his body, which produced a little bit more power. And then, Oh, by the way, he has a devastating pitch that it was added to that. But if you like, obviously, with my experience, you know, that I, I've, I've worked alongside of him. Like he's got five elite pitches. It's not just the two that everybody talks about. He's got five. Mm-hmm. And I think that comes with the idea of like, I've never some, I've never seen somebody in my entire career that is elite focused when they're trying to accomplish something on the mound, when he's doing his side work or bullpen work or his touch and feels his focus here in his mind right. is is at the utmost level. And I think that's what it takes to, to because we're on a, a basically a command show, like that's what it takes to get to the next level from a command standpoint. I think the ball follows your eyes in a lot of ways and your eyes can dictate the way your body moves. And I yeah, think absolutely. the more we on? fine tune that, the better we get. Yeah. It's like we were talking earlier about uh, Dan Hefner again at DBU and the lessons he would teach about standing at attention for the uh, anthem. and uh, paying attention to that little detail is so important because if you pay attention to all those little details in your profession, then the bigger things in your profession are going to improve as well. And uh, we've seen that time and time again. What part of that has control and command played in the development of your pitchers? I mean, how has that evolved over the years? Mm-hmm. That's. I mean, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. It's very loaded, but at the same time, it's it's always been the foundation. Um, even when I was, and I still am, obviously wanting to build the best repertoire a pitcher can have in the confines of what they're physically able to do. Um, I think it all starts and stops with being able to throw it where you want to throw it. And I think there's certain things that well, um, go in. Is, is is how did you do that? Like different methods of training control versus command. Uh, I'm yeah, sure it's think, evolved over the years, you know? Yeah, I think um, from the the tools that we have um, to the uh, mechanisms that we put in, in the bullpen area to uh, work on throwing from your catch play with your partner, a little task that we do with that from game planning, uh, a little different uh, competition things uh, during every single day catch play um, to bullpen work where we have – um, like people, people joke about like uh, strings being a strike zone was a bad thing. Like they're still being used at a high level. Oh, I, and think I think I think they're good. I think they're good. They're great. And I and I as as people always talk like people who know me know that like my heart and soul is as old school as it gets in this game. Like I I breathe the essence and the art of this game, but my brain is in a different spectrum. It's it's trying to maximize the the tools and the data and the, and the technology that we're, that is well, in our that, palm of well, our hands. That's the so great the, combination. When you have two, those two together, that's the perfect combination. 
Yeah, they consider those people blend guys. And I think I'm a blended guy where I take those mm-hmm. tools and I maximize it. So in bullpen yeah. work, we, we will use multiple different tools. Some will be what people classify as old school and some might be what classify as new school. We have oh, technology that. that's, that's unbelievable that allows us to do things. Why wouldn't you not leverage that in your, yeah. in your approaches and that? But I think another piece of it that isn't stated enough and not just what you do in catch play in your bullpen sessions is the mental aspect of it. It's, it's trained. Like I want, yeah. there's certain times where uh, we need to focus on the little intricacies of a pitch that's one time, but there's other times where you need to make practice extremely difficult for them. So when they go into the game, uh, they just get to go have fun and execute what they've been working on. And I think that preparation that you do and the way you ebb and flow and what exercises you do or what uh, games you play in midst of catch play or bullpens or what challenges you bring on to them, that allows them to be prepared and feel that confidence with that. And I think that goes to the mental side of things of being able to challenge them like they've never been challenged before in a bullpen session or a side session that well, leads yeah. into them feeling free and open to be able to execute the pitches when there's a hitter in the box. Yeah. Well, remember that the target I made, I have uh, Casey Mulholland using that uh, and he had a number of pitchers and what they would do is they put it in multiplayer mode mm-hmm. and he did a really cool thing. Instead of them all throwing to the same zone, like they could pitch the squares, he let them pick their own zone. I think this is brilliant. And so they're getting a score, a command score from what they hit. And what he did was he let them pick their own zone. So they picked the zones that they th- are most confident in. Mm. And so That's it so let good. them compete and they got a score, but it also told him what his pitchers are confident doing and what they're not confident doing. And so yep. he could then go back and train them to be better at those things they're not good at. Yeah, uh, I, I, I really think good. I've done that. I've done, I've done that significantly the exact same. And I've also flipped it the other side. I've done the, like, not with your command tracker, but potentially in the future we will. Um, I've done a situation where I've had multiple guys compete against each other since we have in the minor leagues and college baseball, we have multiple mounds in a row, right? So you can throw multiple people with multiple catchers. And basically I would, I would make a competition amongst the guys that are very, very similar in what they do well and how their pitches um, are um, seen by a hitter. And like from carry guys with big curveballs to right. horizontal guys that have depth sinkers to a guy who's got a sweeper, whatever. We pair them together, right? And then I sequence their stuff and events that potentially is that play off each other from the tunneling aspect of things um, to let them understand one, why I'm doing that. And two, from mm-hmm. a deeper perspective from a data perspective why that it has been successful right and so i will challenge them in the moment so we have these cool things from game day signals to pitch com where i can just buzz in a, a pitch and they look down and they go and they try to execute it there's points for guys that execute it in the location that they do execute it in and there's points that are taken away from guys that don't and it's a mono me mono competition in a bullpen setting with guys that um, have similar stuff and similar strengths that have relative difference in command and control, and they're able to outcompete each other. And they don't want to whatever the end result is of the end of the competition. They don't want to be that guy that their teammate just beat out because they executed more pitches than the other person. And so, in variability of the sequencing, variability of the. Um, action because some guys might miss in certain locations and you want to play other pitches off that you try to work within the confines of what each pitcher's misses and like that challenge has allowed guys to understand themselves a little bit deeper in what we call the data world of understanding and what the, next, and what the next step would be if you did miss right. you know yeah exactly and how without a hitter in there without the hitter confrontation you can understand how to attack a hitter with the strengths that you do have and the limitations that you do have yeah. What I did with the command tracker target was I put in a thing called scripted bullpens. And so I, I defined a number of them that used certain pitches in certain ways, kind of like you described. So you could tell a pitcher a throw scripted bullpen number 11. He throws it. He has to, it tells him what pitch to throw where, and then it measures each pitch to the sequence. So he gets a score. So if he's getting an 80% score on this sequence and then – another sequence that gets a 20%, you kind of know what he has to work on and he does too. And the other cool thing is uh, when you have these pitchers competing against each other uh, in a bullpen, I've noticed the uh, focus and intensity 
level jump up. Yeah, through the roof. Um, I mean, and, and they're the high fiving each other when they they get the score, and you know, and I, then they go I have in the a new house. They go in the clubhouse and they rag on each other when they don't, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. that's building some sort of connectivity between your team, and and that that goes. I, that's what that's what you need in April when stuff's not going your way. You need that connection, and that that's right. built through things like this. And I think it builds another thing that's important is accountability, because a lot oh, of bullpens sure. are thrown; they're just going through the motions, and this is giving you a score, so it gives you an accountability for your work. And mm -hmm. so they're not just going through the motion. You're getting some, you know, benefit from, from this work, you know, I, yeah, I think that's the, important. There's one, since I've been a pitching coach my first year, there's two things I ask. Well, there's two questions I ask, um, uh, regardless of the intent of the, my I'm, intent I'm, as the pitching I'm, coach. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Cause I'm thinking you're going to say the thing that I've always said to someone. I don't know. Well, um, that's but here. the, the biggest thing is I ask the pitcher, what is your focus today and how you're going to, how are you going to execute it? And I ask it every single day. And if they say, Oh, I just want to throw strikes today. It's no. going to be like, no, more specific. Tell me why, tell me how, yeah. tell me which pitch, yeah. tell me all that. And I, I, I make them focus on a singular thing. I'm not yeah. saying like, Oh, I want my curveball to do this. I want it to be from a data perspective. I want it to be negative 10 on the track, man. And I want to carry my heater at 17 inches. I'm like, pick one. Because yeah. we know as athletes and, and pitching coaches that have had experience with guys, they can't, they can't go back and forth. They have to focus on what they can do. And, and in the world of, of gone are the days of let's go five fastballs away, five fastballs in, two curveballs. Like gone are those days of that's how they used to do it kind of deal. It's more of variability and how you sequence in game in a bullpen setting, you hold them accountable to the standards that they set for themselves. Yeah. No matter if you if you had a different thought process, because you need to meet your guy where they're at that day. And if you try to build out something that is so um, matter of fact in whether it's building the the execution and command of one single pitch, but the kid's mind is on a completely different thought process, you're probably not going to accomplish what you need to accomplish. So you have to give a give and take a little bit in the process of being a pitching coach to allow them to accomplish something that day to build on instead of just wasting your time and just checking the box of, Hey, we threw 25 pitches today. All right, let's yeah. go get them next week. Kind of. Yeah. Deal. I, yeah. I would always say, what are we working on today? Yeah. And we would discuss what, what the goal of the day was, whether it could be working on a slider away or a cutter in or sure. whatever it was, what are we working on? Or, it doesn't necessarily on? matter what the, what they're working on it's like like how they're going to accomplish it and i think if you give them the the uh, canvas to paint on and the avenue to dictate what they're going to do then you can hold like, them accountable to the standards that you have as a pitching coach yeah. to be able to execute the game plan of that bullpen and i think that allows you to both have an ownership of, of both the player having ownership in his career and trying to get better in his development cycle but also you as a pitching coach to hold them to a standard yeah. that they don't necessarily see yet yeah now, since you went over uh, in the Korean Baseball uh, League there, uh, do they th do things differently there than we are doing here in the pros or in college? Yeah, um, yeah, dramatically different. Um, I think that, uh, well, I'll say this. I was brought over to change the culture in the pitching side um, from being able to leverage all the cool things that we have, but also move it, move the needle forward to be more without taking the essence of the culture away as the Korean culture in baseball, mm -hmm. without taking that away, moving the needle forward to be more uh, alike to the American side of things or the major league baseball standard. And mm -hmm. with that being said, like the training is different um, from a pitch, from a bullpen standard, they throw a mass amount of their volume oriented um, uh, pitchers and they want to, um, just get their amounts of pitches in, not necessarily the the accomplishing the goal of what potential command of a pitch is or the action of a pitch is. It's more like this is my repertoire and I'm going to throw a lot of it and try to get my body ready to throw a lot of it. Granted, they they understand the ins and outs of like where pitches shape to and how they miss and, and, and all the things of that nature. But like there was no distinct focus in uh, trying to accomplish something that day rather than just checking the box of getting my work in. 
Um, they're very much a, uh, uh, when they work, they work hard or they work very little. So it's like if, if today's a recovery day, it's a very little work day. If today's a get, uh, get my work in on the mound, I'm going to exhaust all things to get my body to understand what it takes to manage that workload. So um, from a pitching standpoint, I was there to teach them like, the um the essence of the art of it right why we throw pitches why your pitches are good why you don't need to do this or why you need to do this more um because of the results based on um how they get people out and how they what their limitations are as, as pitchers and so it was a really good i explained it this way the hitters the hitters are a little bit more advanced in their approaches than the pitchers are to attack those approaches, if that makes sense. Um, and there is a definite distinct disadvantage because they don't have the stuff that American pitchers have. They can make the ball move and do things, but their 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 best bolt is not as hard as anywhere else in the world's best bolt. And so from a mm -hmm. physical standpoint, from an athlete standpoint, they're a little bit less athletic, but yet they're more mobile and they're more um, – they're more able to do things in positions in their bodies that some of us aren't um, as equipped to be able to do. And so I think well, it's so, a, it sounds like they may be more durable than if they're throwing that volume, like you said, they're 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 a little bit more durable, durable because their their training mechanisms from like strength conditioning are completely different than uh, the Americanized versions of it. And so you have to work in the confines of that. But they also manage their workloads from a skill specific scenario rather than a. Uh, strength conditioning specific scenario they're trying to build throwing skills and hitting skills and ground ball skills mm -hmm. rather than uh sh training the body to take on the sport that they play if that makes sense yeah yeah uh what role do you think uh mechanics play in repeatable command now i know of yeah. course it's kind of a loaded question where no one repeats their delivery exactly the same and i always describe that you're going to have a variance but what kind of role do you think mechanics play in command or do you think? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a very loaded question and I can go different ways with this, but I think it's extremely significant, but everybody's well, different, right? Well, like, see, I'm, I'm kind of looking for like, how would a pitcher know what kind of mechanics that would help him develop better command, like not moving your head and the, the normal kind of cues, you know? Sure, yeah, sure. I think, um, it goes back to understanding the individual, right? They have to understand themselves. And so from a physical standpoint, they have to understand what they can and can't do and what is keeping them away from doing something a little bit better and what is the reason why they're good, if that makes sense. Um, and I think there's different ways to skin a cat. They're, they're, in the world that we live in now with, I mean, we have a pitching lab, a biomechanics lab, and shout out to Kinetrax. They have great product, but- I, I've um, heard about it. I've heard about it. You're very lucky to get that. That's a great yeah, lab. We're, we're, we're very blessed to, to have the resources that we do. Um, but I think um, we can't go into the new school version of cookie cutting, right? Like you can't just make everybody throw the baseball the same way because it's biomechanically sound in a vacuum. Everybody's body is built up a certain way. They've had trauma in their body throughout their lives a certain way and their, and their anatomy has built them up a certain way. There's things you can work on to build strength deficits, stability deficits, things of that nature. But at the end of the day, people throw the way they throw because of how they're physically built. And I think you have to work in the confines. You have to know the body as a coach. You have to know the body to the umph degree to be able to diagnose these things, but there's people that just throw terms out all the time because it's cool and it's been talked about rather not understanding who they're working with. And I, so, so to answer your question, very, very straightforward is like mechanics is a huge part, but you have to know what, like what somebody's good mechanics is might be yeah. the, the same, per, the other person's bad mechanics. And you can't, they're not cookie cut it into a situation yeah. where, um, physically, everybody has to move the same because that's not that's not right, and that's not how um, uh, the bodies organize themselves. People or their bodies organize themselves differently to throw a baseball and produce the output. Again, there's some strength and stability things that you can can work on to kind of iron some things out that kind of fix themselves. But at the same time, um, the way you the way you move directly affects how the ball comes out of your hand. And sometimes when you try to edit some of the things people do when they move, takes away from why they're good. And I think you have yeah, to understand I, the difference between the, the all those factors. Yeah, I described in a show with Dan Duquette about this is that uh, he was laughing. I said, too often they cookie cut uh, a pitcher or a hitter 
uh, to move a certain way so that they will never know if Dan Duquet could have been the greatest hitter on the planet. All right. So that you're erasing any kind of individual that he may have been. And I described to you before the show about uh, working with my son, uh, having no idea about baseball. We looked at a, uh, a video of every time he threw. We had an iPad. And when he threw better, we used that movement to then reinforce. So it was, uh, we iterated through that process. So his delivery came from what he himself came up with. Mm-hmm. And the best version of him. And I think you'll never find out who a DeGrom was until DeGrom throws like DeGrom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Very you know, true. So I really love your answer that you were saying. It's not throwing a certain way. And like you said, there are certain cues uh, for, you know, your lead leg block and, you know, your head being still. But as a pitching coach, I think the more you let the guy be him, you may find he's the greatest pitcher ever because that style is him. Yeah, you got to you gotta allow people to be great. And I think with that being said, you have to allow them to also be the best version of themselves. Not, yeah. I don't need to make Wayne Boyle Ricky Meinhold, you know? Like, no, it's that's not, right. that's, even, even if I was a good pitcher or bad, like, you just have to maximize the individual strengths and, and work on the, the things that they potentially – um, aren't as good at, but also at the same time, you have to be real with yourself when, when you try to go down a road and it's not producing the things you're producing because you're take again, taking away from the potential greatness of somebody. And I think you have to one, be humble enough to know you don't know everything. Uh, two, you have to be humble enough to know that like, you're not in it for yourself. You're in it for the individual. And I think if you lead with those things out front, then you can serve people the way they're, they're, they're supposed to be served in the, in the moment of time that you get to work with them. Yeah. I like the way you said that too, because uh, uh, my favorite pitching coach is, is uh, Scott Emerson and he always he's describes a, he's, a it, he's awesome. And, but he always describes as he is serving his pitchers. Yep. You know, he's not their boss, but he's serving them. He, and yep. he's a great coach. And I think because he's trying to, he really wants to help them. He really, you know, likes them. Yeah, and uh, Emo's a good friend and um, definitely somebody that I can know that if I needed something, I'd call and, and share some thoughts with him to get get his opinion and his experience and his wisdom to pour into me. And I know he would if I called him. But I think that is the essence of coaching is yeah. to yeah. understand that it's not about you. It's about them. Um, it's about serving and, and checking your ego out the door. I think we live in a world – um, that the egos are out front and um, it's just, it's not productive in, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. It might get you that flashy thing for a short amount of time, but at the end of the day, um, your job um, as a coach is to impact the people that um, uh, are put in front of you. And, and how you do that is uh, meeting them where they're at and understanding that you're the coach and they're the player and, and never forgetting what that feels like as a player. Um, and I think to, um, I'm, I'm very much in tune and in the same with Emo and, and how he thinks about serving his athletes. All, I, I want to hold our pitchers to a standard that is extremely high, that, uh, that, is, um, that is hard to attain. But at the same time, I want them to hold – to, I want them to hold me accountable to those actions as well. And so I have no problem if a pitcher comes into my office and says, Ricky, I need more. I need, I need more out of you individually. Mm-hmm. I need more out of you day to day. Um, I, I – I have no ego in this. I'm here to serve them and help them get to realize dreams. And I say that on every well, recruiting pitch. And I try to hold that to myself daily because that's truly what I believe as a pitching coach. Yeah. And, and that's why you also have a re- reputation like Emo has. That's why we're talking in the show. You know? oh, I appreciate that. Uh, what role does mental toughness and confidence have play in pitching? Yeah. Um, it's not talked about enough. Um, I think that we need to train that significantly every single day because, again, I I alluded to it earlier, is I like to make practice hard at times. um, uh, Mm -hmm. So when they go out and they play in the game, it's just a bunch of fun. Like I always talk about, like, in the world that we live in now that um, pitching coaches are are being mandated to call pitches because we haven't taught the game deep enough at the amateur level or at the level before they got to when you get to them 
um, to, uh, to have them understand how to sequence pitches and, and the art of pitching side. You get to call pitches on these little Nintendo devices that uh, Game Day Signals, Pitchcom, and, and so forth. Like, I like to say, like, hey, I, I'm going to work hard as your pitching coach and put you in a position to be successful. But, like, I just want to go watch you compete. And, yeah, I'll play Nintendo and call the pitches that I think will put you in the position uh, to be successful. But at the end of the day, it's a joy for me to watch you go out and compete against hitters because you well, put the work in to do that. Yeah, well, also, I believe that if the pitcher has confidence and conviction in what's going to be thrown, when you tell him to throw that sequence, he's going to say, ah, I know Ricky's got it. He's going to throw it so much better if he knows about it and believes in, believes in it, you know? 100%. Like, I don't in, – in my process as a pitching coach and, and serving even the minor leagues and the major leagues also in college, but mainly speaking in college – like I'm, I'm, I'm not just, they know why I'm calling these pitches because I've gone over things with them individually about what right. their strengths are. And, right. and, and tell them why it is needed. Yeah. Right. Layers upon layers, depending on the individual, right? Like I can't give every guy every single layer, but I've got to get, meet them where they're at. And I'm not asking them to have PhDs in any of the, of this stuff, but I want them to have some surface level understanding of why they're good. And so when they go to the next level, it's, they don't have to worry about the bumps in the road of all this information that teams are giving them. They can just go out and compete and get out hitters. But at the same time, that's my job to put put water in their water guns or put put some bullets in their gun to be able to shoot. And mm -hmm. when they do shoot them, that they actually have a, a, a distinct um, possibility of being a successful um, executed pitch Um Putting, putting that information into them of understanding why we sequence pitches the way we do gives them confidence to be like, yep, like last year, I, I, it, was a, it was a compliment that the head coach gave to me um, in front of the team, which I, he didn't, I didn't know he was going to say that, but they said, how much confidence as pitchers does it bring to you that after you've thrown the pitch, the pitchers, the pitch, the catchers caught it, he's throwing the ball back to you and you already feel a buzz on your wrist because you know what the next pitch is because I'm already mm -hmm. ready. Like I'm, I've already seen what I need to see. I knew what I, I saw what was executed or not executed. Yeah. And I know the game plan on the next play. And the, every single pitcher raised their hand and said, yeah, like, I don't have to think Ricky, Ricky helps me think. And like, at the same time, that's a compliment because I'm equipping them with uh, like a game plan that they feel confident in. But at the same time, it also makes me feel really small because I want to equip them to understand that themselves. So I, they don't have to worry about, it. they can look down and expect a pitch and they know, yep, that's exactly what, uh, right, that's I expected, what I would right? I would prefer that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and we and we eventually got there um as mm -hmm. a staff. Like I would it, it would be in between innings and I'd go meet the pitcher somewhere on the bench after they cool off. And and I had a pitcher tell me, I really liked what you did there. I was thinking the exact same thing and and we had a, a lot of success with it. And that's what you want to get to. But at yeah. the same time, everybody's different and their their aptitude of 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 what they're, you're challenging to do like how they take that in that it's it varies guy to guy yeah i think i heard uh it was a uh, danica Pratt patrick was talking on a show once and i heard her say a saying that i really like which was thoughts become things mm -hmm. and yeah. and in pitching uh that describes kind of my attitude about what you have to think about when you're pitching like you don't want the negative your, your thoughts become things you know? Yeah, like I, I like to challenge guys so much that they come into the office later to ask me more questions about it because they didn't understand it, right? Yeah. Like I want to give them so many things that they like want to come talk to you about it so then you can pour into them and then they can tell their teammate. And uh, it was a really cool thing last year. Uh, we uh, we had a significant thing that we were talking about and uh, a kid got done with the activity and we had 17 pitchers and 16 of them uh, one had class so he can come, but 16 of them came in the office with that kid to hear the answer of what I was going to tell them. And that we sat there for 35 minutes, the entire pitching staff and went over one guy's stuff so they could understand him better. That, so they can awesome. understand themselves better. Yeah. That's the environment you're trying to create, right? You're trying to create yeah. a learning environment where guys are curious and they ask questions and then you get to pour into them. And then hopefully as the time goes on, you stop talking and then the, the, the team starts talking to themselves and you just kind of, you're moderating it basically. And I think that's, you know, that's what you, you want as a coach. Like I said, at the beginning of this, like I want to eliminate myself as a pitcher because I want to pour into them enough where they can police themselves. They can answer each other's questions and be able to um, kind of go with the flow 
depending on the individual and, and what they're what the task they're asking. It's like yeah. talking to you, I just had the thought App State is gonna go really far this year. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm you know? hopeful that we can move the needle and and then obviously complete compete. Our goal is to be the best college team in baseball. Like right, we're trying to be the last guy standing, and I think that yeah. Takes well, you that. got that new pitching lab. They got you. If you're a pitcher, right. you got to be. A, you have to be going to App State now. Well, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful to bring some people to the beautiful town of Boone. And and as you can see in the background, it's it, the the weather's changed dramatically. I'm sitting outside. Well, it on the was back beautiful porch. before when we were talking. Yeah, and now the the clouds have come in over the mountains, and it's it's kind of cool. I mean, Boone has its own um, kind of own landscape. I've never lived in a mountain town. Um, it's got so many things to offer that I never saw. Um, I, I I told somebody the other day, I came when I came on my uh, my two day interview deal um, when Kermit brought me in. It rained for two straight days, and I was like, man, I didn't know this place was like Seattle. Like it's it's raining a lot. <laughs> Um, right. But I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And I was like, what am I saying to myself? Like, how do I think this place is beautiful? I haven't seen the sun. I ha it's it's like upper 60s, low 70s in the summertime. Like, what's going on here? But it was it's just something spoke to me about this place. And since I've been here, it's been even better than than I could imagine. And, and our family settled in here and it's been really great. But yeah, this That's awesome. we're hoping hopeful to turn this place into somewhere where people are attracted to not just from the landscape of of the town and Boone and the mountains and, and the weather but also um to to be the best baseball player you can be and it's not just pitching we have tremendous resources from our coaching experience and, and the people that coach uh, on the hitting and defensive side uh to the resources we have from tech and and all the cool things that they the kids like nowadays uh, on the field so I think we're hopefully uh, going to build a juggernaut in player development that people are attracted to that would uh, think, choose to come here. I think here. you are. Uh, yeah, that's, what, that's kind of, what kind of pitchers are you looking for to recruit to, to App State? Yeah, I think it starts with uh, the baseline thing as a human being. We want high character individuals. Um, we want people that want to be great. We want people that want to be great for App State. And we want people that want to want to develop into the best human being and baseball player they possibly can. Um, from a like a specific standpoint on the pitching side, I'm looking for athletes, the guys, and and they come in all shapes and sizes. And they come in um, what they look like in a uniform might not tell you what how athletic they might be. So you have to kind of dive into it. But I want people that compete. Um, obviously, have a a baseline level of of stuff and command that allow them to be successful. But I think people that um, that I'm into is uh, people that uh, serve their team first and are a good teammate and have high character, but also have something to uh, to get some hitters out with. And I think that comes in, again, different shapes and sizes and different yeah. stuff. Um, I don't want the same guy. I don't want the same guy with a different jersey number on our team. I want uniqueness. I want difference. Um, it's, it's how I've always been uh, the last – 13 years of my coaching career is not having the same guy over and over and over again. And, and we live in the world of, Oh, this pitch is great. So I'm going to teach everybody this pitch. Well, it might not be great for that guy. And so there, I yeah. want the, I want the uniqueness from, from the individual to, to show itself. And, and I'll re recruit that in the process as well. Yeah. I was talking with Micah Posey on the show from Florida state and he was kind of saying yeah. the same thing is he, he's building a staff. They don't all have to be the same. They have to have their unique qualities that makes them them that, uh, could be a tool for him to use in a game, you know? Yep. I, from the big leagues all the way down to division two, when I first started coaching, um, I want some, I want people that are different, but at the, at the, the baseline foundation of them, I want them to be high character people, people you can trust people that want to go to work and, and get, come here to be the best pitcher they possibly can be. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a certain individual. Everybody says it, um, but uh, not everybody does it. And I think that shows in, in kind of how they carry themselves and how their teammates look at them and how their coaches evaluate them as well as how they perform on the field. Well, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm biased towards DBU. Um, right. I love one of my best, one of my best friends in the game is their new pitching coach, Kale Johnson. And he is, oh, okay. he is, but, he, he's going to do well there and they're going to yeah, enjoy having him. But they have a team chemistry that is always coming the same way. And that comes from the coaches that set that team at chemistry. And it comes from yeah. what you were just saying. So that's why when you were saying about the things that you talked about, it reminded me of what I hear at DBU. And I and then I think about the success that DBU has had. And I thought, well, App State is going to have a lot of success. 
Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're hopeful, and and obviously we'll do our best as coaches to provide the environment to to make that happen. And uh, yeah, it's it's a good time to be at App State. It's definitely a good time to be at App State baseball for sure. Yeah, especially that new pitching lab too. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's it's pretty nice. Uh, you should now, come see it this, anytime you can. Yeah, uh, this part of the show, what I do is I ask uh, everyone to pick their top four qualities that they would like for a pitcher. Now, I think, and everybody also thinks that you need all of these qualities. So yeah. we're kind of looking to find what are the top four. So okay. if you would please look at this, I'll show it to you on the screen. I'll read it out to the people who are listening so they can know what they are. Uh, the first is character, command, changing speeds, movement, max velocity, sequencing, reading batters, mental toughness and know who you are yeah wow okay some go with each other so i'm gonna this is gonna be a little bit more uh straightforward um i think like i said i think the first like pro ball and college ball a little bit different thought process in the what i want as a pitcher thing um because i think at the end of the day they still they they still all come out in the wash but a character thing is a big deal to me as a human being. And so I think character is, is very much, um, if it's not the top, it's it's definitely up there. But I think the, um, the three at the bottom kind of sum up the other, um, other three that I would say, because they go in with the rest of them, like sequencing, max velocity, movement, changing speeds, command, go into reading batters. They go into mental toughness and it goes into knowing who you are. And so I think for me, knowing who you are is a big deal because that, that is you need to be a, a, a good enough self-evaluator to know what you're good at and to know what you're not so good at to be able to create a game plan to go forward from a developmental standpoint as well as a mm -hmm. competition standpoint and so i think that's a kind of a, um, a deeper one mental toughness is somebody who can handle um adversity when it's thrown out their way and how they navigate through that adversity is how mentally tough you can be and i think that needs to be trained daily but also needs to be like a foundational piece to athletes in general not just in our sport but in all sports because it, it yeah. we like the old saying of like you're a hall of famer if, if you are, are a 300 hitter so that means out of 10 at bats you're failing seven times right like Failure yeah. is a big part of our game. And I think the ability to navigate the failure is what sets people apart to be the best that they can be. And then the reading batters thing goes in with the sequencing movement, max velocity, all that stuff. Like you have to understand how the hitter is attacking your stuff and how that, what they're doing with that. And that, uh, that needs to have a little bit of tea leave off of it that understands the sequencing. Why am I sequencing a certain way? Um, why am I getting the results I'm getting and how am I getting that? Well, my velocity needs to, my, my speed changing and my movement capacity of each pitch needs to do a certain thing to be able to have success. Well, being able to read what the hitter sees off your stuff to be able to make that adjustment kind of goes into it. So I think I will take off the, the pitching specific sequencing max or velocity movement changing speeds command because i think that all goes into knowing who you are how mentally tough you are and how you can read hitters so that's mm -hmm. my four i, I awesome. guess that's a hard question because all those things like you can hear yeah you can hear different versions of, of it that kind of come to the same thing that i was saying but they might use the other four as their top four right so um I, you definitely did that for a reason and, and definitely loaded but um that would be my yeah. four just because of how I, how my perspective is. Well, yeah. Like uh, Dan DeQuit put it nicely too, when he said uh, you can act like a chef and take ingredients to create different pitchers, like a finesse pitcher, a power pitcher. Uh, like you can create different types of pitchers by drawing out four or five qualities from that list. Mm -hmm. uh, and I yep. think if you have them all, you're going to be a Jarrett Cole or a DeGrom or a Verlander or one of the great pitchers, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Well, Ricky, it's been awesome having you on the show. You know, well, thank uh, you. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. I, and I wish you great success at App State. And awesome. I hope to talk to you a lot more later. Yeah, Wayne, I appreciate it as well. This is a lot of fun. I always like talking the game, especially pitching. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. Good night. Welcome to the Pitching Command Show, brought to you by Command Tracker, the smart target that MLB and D1 teams rely upon to measure and train command. Many throw hard, but few command. 
visit commandtracker.com.